My topic if, is importance of exercise for urinary incontinence prevention and available evidence on stretching and perineal massage. Uh, the aims of my presentation is to give an overview of the literature on the evidence behind the use of pelvic floor muscle exercise during pregnancy and after delivery in prevention and treatment of urinary incontinence. And also do the same concerning stretching, perineal massage, and the use of the EpiNo uh, device. And I also would like to give uh, an example of an evidence-based training protocol, which we have used in all our studies in Norway. There is evidence that childbearing results in higher risk of incontinence. So the question is, how can we prevent dysfunction of the pelvic floor muscles? Uh, from the previous lecture, we have heard that it is important to, to decide if you should have an elective cesarean section, and also the kind of obstetric management that, uh, that will be used in, uh, in uh, women. However, I think all agree that we need strategies to treat and rehabilitate pelvic floor damage. Pelvic floor muscle training is one such strategy. Other strategies that have been used are perineal massage and stretching techniques. The first question I would like to, to answer is if uh, antenatal perineal massage can reduce perineal trauma. Uh, we have one Cochrane uh, review on this topic from Beckman and Stock from 2006, and they found four trials in total, 2,497 women. And they found in these uh, studies that uh, for primiparous uh, women, uh, antenatal perineal massage may reduce the likelihood of perineal trauma, reduce reporting of ongoing perineal pain, and that the techniques are well accepted between the women. However, did, they did not find any differences in the incidence of instrumental deliverers, uh, sexual satisfaction, or incontinence. Nevertheless, women should be made aware of the likely benefit of perineal massage and provided information on how to massage. The next question is if antenatal digital perineal massage uh, stretching can reduce perineal trauma. Here I found one prospective observational study on this topic from Smith and co-workers, uh, published in 2013. They had uh, data from 2,754 uh, women, both nilliparous and multiparous. However, they found no evidence for an association between use of perineal stretching during second stage of labor with oasis or any other spontaneous perineal trauma. The next question, can antenatal use of the EpiNo device reduce perineal trauma? The purpose of using the EpiNo device would be to stretch the vaginal wall up to its maximum diameter. And when you're doing this repeatedly, it uh, would facilitate perineal distension during birth and labor. That's, that's the, um, the way we th uh, should think it should work. Uh, here we have two systematic reviews, which I'm going to, to uh, say something about. It's one from Brito and co-workers from 2015, including five studies, three randomized controlled trials. Uh, the conclusion was that they found no reduction in episiotomy rates or perineal te tears after using this device. Also, <clears throat> the systematic review from Kavidas and Hosley uh, from 2016, also here five studies, two of them randomized controlled trials. Uh, the same conclusion, no reduction in episiotomy rates or perineal tears. So then the last question, can pelvic floor muscle exercise during pregnancy and after delivery prevent urinary incontinence? We know that the pelvic floor muscles are important continence mechanisms. They give support for the to the pelvic organs, and uh, a fast and strong contraction of the pelvic floor muscles is important uh, when, uh, when it, it comes to sudden or abrupt intra-abdominal pressure rise. 
And the muscles have to be able to squeeze and lift. That's the function of these muscles. The theory behind the use of pelvic floor muscle exercises have also been uh, uh, written about. And to prevent descent to the pelvic floor, it is important to learn to consciously contract before and during an increase in intra-abdominal pressure and continue to perform contractions as a behavioral modification. That is one way we can think about it. Uh, another is that uh, to perform strength training over time to build up stiffness in a muscle muscles and thereby give structural support to the pelvic floor is another uh, rationale for pelvic floor muscle exercises. And we have studies that has um, uh, assessed morphological changes after pelvic floor muscle exercises. We know that uh, uh, in a study from Brecken and co-workers using ultrasonography, they found uh, differences between exercise and control groups when it came to muscle thickness after a training period, uh, increased muscle thickness in the exercise group, reduced hiatal area, reduced muscle length, and one may argue that when the hiatal area and the muscle length during Valsalva are reduced, uh, this indicates uh, increased pelvic floor muscle stiffness. We have several studies during the last 15, 20 years on the effect of pelvic floor muscle exercise during pregnancy to prevent urinary incontinence, both in women with and without urinary incontinence at inclusion. I won't go strictly into all these uh, studies, but I just would like you to see that we, during the last years, have actually have very many uh, randomized controlled trials in this field. And you can see that uh, in most of the studies, um, urinary incontinence have been reduced in the exercise group. But, uh, but the results are not the same in all the studies, and I will discuss that a bit later. The same when we have a category of uh, women uh, exercising during pregnancy to treat uh, urinary incontinence. Also here we have some studies, two of them showing effect of the exercises. And we have studies showing effect of uh, or, or assessing effect of pelvic floor muscle exercise after delivery to prevent urinary incontinence in women with and without urinary incontinence at inclusion. This is both, in a way, both prevention and treatment. Uh, also here we can see that most studies show an effect, reduced urinary incontinence in the exercise groups. And the same when it comes to the effect of pelvic floor muscle exercise after delivery to treat urinary incontinence. We have uh, in our late, uh, latest uh, Cochrane review, which we know are uh, uh, doing an update on, uh, we have asked the question, is pelvic floor muscle training better than usual antenatal or postnatal care for the prevention and treatment of urinary incontinence? And we have divided into three questions concerning primary or secondary prevention, treatment studies, and what we call the population approach which is an approach where, we, where both women with and without urinary incontinence at inclusion, those studies are, are in this group. We found that pregnant women without prior urinary incontinence who were randomized to intensive antenatal pelvic floor muscle training were less likely than women randomized to no pelvic floor muscle training or usual antenatal care to report urinary incontinence up to six months after delivery. And we found that postnatal uh, women with persisting urinary incontinence needing treatment three months after delivery and who received pelvic floor muscle training were less likely than women who did not receive treatment or received usual postnatal care to report urinary incontinence 12 months after delivery. And the last category, uh, the results of seven studies show the statistically significant result favoring pelvic floor muscle training in a mixed population, meaning women with and without urinary incontinence symptoms 
at inclusion when it came to late pregnancy. So this Cochrane reviews, uh, this Cochrane review and also the latest ICI report, which was uh, presented yesterday, uh, show uh, if mainly good effects of pelvic floor muscle exercises. But the discussion is, as I said, not all the studies report good effect of pelvic floor muscle exercises. But then we have to look into, into the studies, of course, we have to look into the methodological part of the papers, but I think the most important is to look into the intervention. We have to look at the contrast between training and control groups in these reports. Uh, we have to look uh, into the training frequency and intensity used because it differs very much. And also follow up or adherence. Because if women are not doing these exercises, we won't, uh, they, they won't work of course. If you, give, uh, if you ask a woman to, to take medication and she doesn't take the medication, of course, we won't expect the, uh, the medication to work. That's the same with exercises as well. So the success seems to be related uh, upon the intervention, training frequency and intensity, strength training of the pelvic floor muscles, and close follow-up. Uh, and it seems like the more intensive the program, the greater the treatment effect. Um, I will give a short, quick presentation of a training protocol. Um, what we think is important is that the intervention is based on knowledge about training principles, strength training principles, general strength training principles, functional anatomy, motor learning principles, and motivation theory. Because we need adherence strategies, we need the women really to do the exercises. So the instructions are um, important. Instructions in correct pelvic floor muscle contraction. The knowledge about pelvic floor and the functional anatomy so that we can teach the women to do, do the contractions the way they really, the, the muscles function. They squeeze and lift. We use, as I said, general strength training principles. Three sets of high resistant contractions three, three times at least at week. And we need to make, uh, to motivate the women to adhere to the training programs. And of course it's possible to, to include pelvic floor muscle exercises together with other exercises in exercise ses sessions as well. But we need to, to be aware of the pelvic floor muscles specifically. We use different positions for the exercises. And we ask the women to contract the pelvic floor muscles before they lift the babies, for example, or, or sneeze or cough. And we also have shown that the myth that pelvic floor muscle training during pregnancy will cause prolonged labor not uh, have been confirmed in, in trials. So it's not dangerous for women to do pelvic floor muscle exercises during pregnancy. <clears throat> we also have one uh, six-year follow-up uh, showing that uh, a significantly higher percentage of the women in the, in the training group reported improved satisfaction with sex life after delivery than women in the control group. So our advice to pregnant women and also postpartum women is to just keep up and come on and do these exercises and do the, uh, do the exercises the correct way and uh, adhere to the training programs. So that is what the Norwegian words up there says. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>